damn late. I had to stop by the wax museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing they army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, bitch, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, so you guys are introducing the great Karen Katowski, the <laughs> recipient of the 2018 Sam Adams Award. Uh, welcome to the show. How you doing, Karen? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, very good to talk to you again. Um, well, I can't believe you didn't already win this thing, but now you did. And I guess, um, uh, oh, I guess people don't know. This is the Whistleblower Award from, uh, what is the name of the group, uh, Ray McGovern's group here? Um, well, it's the Sam Adams Associates for Integrity and Intelligence. Uh -huh. That's the and it's right. It's mainly the veteran intelligence professionals for sanity. Um, that's probably who you see more emails from. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Ray McGovern, a bunch of people that, you know, that you have on the show all the time. Um, they are uh, uh, kind of behind this. And then, you know, there's a, a lot of people who have won this award and, and I'm sure many others that, that uh, will in the future and, and should have won it. Um, but it's real, you know, I'm hugely honored to be picked this year. And I think, it, you know, it's really because of that Rob Reiner film, Shock mm -hmm. and All. Shocking all. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. It's so funny because I've known you since what two thousand four, if not three, Sooner, um, yeah. since we've been talking, and then uh, certainly known uh, Jonathan Landay uh, from formerly from Knight Ritter and then McClatchy Newspapers, and I forget where he's at now uh, for many years too. And I knew that he was the first reporter to write the Office of Special Projects in the Pentagon, and that was in the fall of. 2000 no no no, no i forget yeah. sometime yeah, in 2002 fall, fall, anyway 2000. it turns out you're the source for that and that's yeah. the scene in the movie is you give them that story and i should have known that how did i not put two and two together about <laughs> you know, that and figure out that you were landay's source for that yeah well actually warren strobel is the guy i was warren strobel oh okay warren strobel they were he partners had, at the time they were partners yeah. and or and my you know when i was in the pentagon you know my name's katowski that's mm -hmm. um k mm -hmm. k plus 10 other letters that nobody wants to pronounce and so my nickname in the Pentagon there uh, in both a couple of offices that I worked in was K-10. And um, they do refer in the movie to K-10. Uh, that was Warren's source. And it was the lady that they had, you know, uh, used to, to display me or whatever. It was, uh, you know, nothing like me, of course, in physical sense. And she also wasn't in the uniform. She wasn't wearing a uniform in the uh, in, in the movie. So and they didn't really know who it was. They didn't know if it was me. They didn't know. It was an active duty military person, an officer. They didn't know that. Um, and then the movie came out, of course, and then it, I mean, 15 years later, I mean, what have I got to lose? Big fat nothing. In fact, anybody who'd followed it kind of knew. You knew. I mean, so many people had read uh, uh, stuff that I'd written, and, and they read the American Conservative three-part series, which really outlined the whole thing. Of course, that was done after I uh, retired. But, um, yeah, when I was talking to Warren, it was it was the summer and fall late summer and fall and winter of 2002, 2003. And, and I showed up in uniform in, when I had meetings with him. But I only, I think, had, I think, one meeting and everything else was done electronically. I see. Oh, very interesting. And then so for the people who were too young or they were a bad guy then or they just didn't know this part of the story, this was mm -hmm. a huge part of the story that, uh, well, as uh, you put it, in Rumsfeld's shop, that was uh, the first of the series for the American Conservative Magazine. It's in Rumsfeld's shop, Conscientious Objector and Open Door Policy. Oh, I kind of forgot about that one for a minute, Karen. Yeah, um, yeah. But in Rumsfeld's shop, there was a whole, not the DIA like you would have, but a whole oh, yeah. separate neoconservative intelligence yep. gathering operation. Is that what you would call it? Yeah. And they were gathering intelligence using the tax-funded intelligence system and backbone. You know, they're going through 
uh, you know, our government computers and any data that had been scooped up from any of the intelligence agencies. So they're looking at it, but they're not conducting, they're not preparing intelligence. They're picking bits and pieces, mostly out of context, and some of it that had never been verified. In fact, some of it had been had been verified to be false in it, but it was, you know, they, if you take that paragraph or that phrase that says this is verified to be false or this didn't happen, and you just put the front part, it looks like it happened. So they were creating a storyline, creating the 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 background uh, papers and everything that would support what the politicians were doing. Now, of course, Cheney Cheney himself is is really kind of orchestrating a lot of this. And you know, you're familiar. You've talked about this a bunch of times. I mean, it's well known that Cheney personally uh, traveled to the CIA multiple times. I mean, he pressured uh, uh, actual analysts, which is uncalled. You know, I mean, never. <laughs> when would you have the vice president talking to analysts? But he but this huge amount of pressure put on them. And he's orchestrating this. His uh, former uh, uh, people that had worked in his office were in charge of uh, Southeast Near Asia. They were in charge of, you know, OSP. He's picking and placing yeah. people. He's running this show. Okay, that's Cheney. And he knew he knew they were making up a story. Cheney lied. There's no doubt. It is not yet clear that President Bush, you know, W, um, did you know? I mean, did he lie or did he get taken for a ride? I mean, we know. Uh, in fact, Wilkerson, Larry Wilkerson, who was chief of staff for Colin Powell, you had Larry on, I'm sure, right? You've talked oh, to Larry. Yeah. Uh -huh. So Larry gave the, if you look at the video, it's not been broken down yet. So Larry gave the, an introductory speech, which um, was really about current events and the neocons and that kind of thing. And um, he he talked a little bit about the uh, what, what happened with Colin Powell. And of course, you saw that in the movie too, the Colin Powell testimony verbatim. I mean, the actual video is, is incorporated into the movie. Now, Colin Powell asked a lot of the right questions, but he still ended up getting kind of taken for this ride and being being uh, uh, made to participate in in what he, I think, suspected in parts were lies, but he wasn't 100% sure. So I'm going to give Colin Powell kind of a, yeah, he probably got, you know, lied to a little bit. And well, maybe the thing is, if you zoom in that closely, like, did they know that this specific lie was tortured out of Alibi or uh, Abu Zubaydah, or did they know that this cartoon of a mobile biological weapons lab drawn up by Clapper's department, that those specific things were based on specific lies? Well, probably not, because they weren't asking those questions. But did That's Powell right. and Bush both know that they were shopping for a bill of goods and that the the oh duty yeah. of the intelligence community was to come up with an excuse to attack Iraq, to come up with something good enough to scare the people enough to let us do this. Absolutely. They knew yeah. they were lying. They, they knew. They knew. And, and they also, I think, and I think we're, we're coming to as a, as a society in the, in the 15 years it's gone by, you know, post nine 11, whatever, you know, we had Obama, and we had, well, we had W, of course, and all the wars that W promised not to get into when he campaigned, then did all that. And then Obama, who continued them. And I think, I think the Obama era was really important in getting people to realize it doesn't matter who it is, they're all lying to you. Um, because, you know, Obama was hope and change, and he was nothing but W3, W2. W um, so, you know, a continuation of these policies. And then you have Trump, who half the population in this country, half the voters in this country, um, absolutely do not respect uh, in any way, shape or form and don't like. And this is good in many ways because, you know, it, it causes us to question, you know, their qualifications. We should be questioning all of their qualifications, not just not just Trump, um, all of them and also their motivations. And we do that now with Trump. We did that a great many people in this country did that with Obama after it became clear he wasn't really giving us hope or change. Um, and, and this is this is a really good thing because these people in the in that are running our country and called deep state, the president's part of it, his staff, all these people, they are extremely arrogant. They're extremely, you know, we are running things. And so their view of the intelligence community is just what you said. And they don't see anything wrong with it. They they see the intelligence community as a tool for them to do what they want to do. Um, it's not It's not uh, just specific to one particular president or W or even Cheney. Uh, and, and if you look at our history, of course, and you know this, we've done this forever. Presidents say, you know, what do I got to, to justify what I want to do? And of course, what he wants to do, he or she, is of course what the deep state wants to do. And then we can talk about why we have these wars. Yeah. Well, and you know, you're featured in the documentary. Someone was asking me recently, what's a good war documentary I should watch? I said, why we fight? 
It's yeah. got a lot of Karen Katowski in there talking about the neocons and a lot of people talking about all the money to be made in and outside the Pentagon, all the contractors and all the arms manufacturers and all the lobbyists and all the bankers too, servicing all those transactions and all the government debt and all the oh, everything. Yeah. Who's not in on it? That's right. Well, you know, it's a shame too because um, these Democrats are so wrapped around the axle, the ones that got elected in Pelosi's crowd, and that there's th- this party is such a warmongering Democratic party, at least the 50 and over side of the House is. And that's who, I mean, these Democrats are older even than Republicans in the House. They're very aged people, I'm sorry to say. And this that generation of Democrats is a bunch of warmongers. They love war. They love the money that they think war makes, even not, not realizing the terrible destruction of everything that war does. In, in their mind, hey, this is profitable. Um, I'm being sponsored by these people. I can get reelected because these people want war and I can vote for it. And yet that party has a beautiful opportunity now, especially since they have a... a pretty good. Well, not so big, but they do have the house. They have the house and they are in a position to shut down or I should say shut, shut down Trump's warlike tendencies, if that's the case, because we never know from day to day or to support Trump's peace oriented tendencies, whichever the day it is. These Democrats have this huge opportunity to do that. And they would look, you know, if they're shutting down Trump, this is a great thing. If they're not shutting him down, if he actually takes a peaceful turn in, in any given decision, you know, they could support that in there. They would actually, that would give them more integrity as an as a party. Right. And yet they're not doing it. They're not right. doing anything. So we and on not- the other side of it, it'd be a great way for him to really stick to them, for him to be Trump the Great by ending all the wars and then letting yeah. all the Democrats attack him from the right all they want and see how what good it does them. You know, if that's what you want to look at. But anyway, let's talk more about what a hero you are. So uh, first no. of all, <laughs> tell us about David Hackworth uh, and Soldiers for yeah. the Truth. Yeah, yeah. Um, Well, back in the day, there was a, uh, well, of course, David Hackworth, he doesn't really need a huge introduction. He was a um, most highly decorated soldier living it for a while there and um, had a lot of experience in, in, uh, well, actually, uh, Korea. I don't even know if he might have had some World War II time. I don't know. But he he served throughout a number of American conflicts and made his way all the way to um, full colonel. very, very well-known guy. And then he wrote a bunch of books and he had a flamboyant type of uh, presentation and, and, uh, you know, he, he was very forceful, very, very much a newsmaker kind of attract, you know, attracted news. Anyway, he had a soldiers for the truth website. And when I first, uh, in the, in the fall, early, early fall, late summer of 2002. Wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me add a couple things about him real quick that yeah, first of all, he was kind of a right winger in the sense of like in the 1990s, he was very much a AM talk radio guest, not so much Rush Limbaugh, but a lot of the other guys, uh, and including kind of Fox news. So you had that kind of, unlike a lot of sort of the, the reputation of veterans who came home from Vietnam and kind of turned into hippies. He was he had turned against the war, but he had not turned left at all in any sense. And also he had sort of, as from everything I knew from his shtick from the 1990s and that kind of thing, was his whole thing essentially was class war. That the enlisted men, they are American human men. The officers are this alien enemy force trying to destroy these wonderful enlisted yeah. boys that need protecting by the likes of Hackworth. And yeah. so, and then of course the think tank eggheads and the crooked politicians and the perfumed princes that he, as he called them, like uh, Wesley Clark. And uh, certainly he would have uh, included David Petraeus. Uh, those guys were yeah. the bad guys and the enlisted men were the heroes. And so that was the frame of, you know, everything was, you know, is this going to be good for the enlisted men? And if it's not, is the sacrifice necessary? Because if it's not, then there's going to be hell to pay for you by me. That was kind of his whole thing. And because he was a colonel, he absolutely could essentially begin everything he said with, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, this is yeah. the deal. And he absolutely was against Iraq War II. And I don't know if he did everything he could, but... Certainly everything I heard from him in 2002 and 2003 was him explaining to talk radio audiences, here's why not to do this. Number one, number two, and really knew what he was talking about and was really forceful about it, as you say. Yeah, yeah, really. He's he's a hero right there. I mean, this this man um, uh, made it his life's work after he got out of the – after he retired, um, you know, to, to inform people and to and, – and, you know, you're right. I didn't remember that, but, um, yeah, he did not go off. To the left side or seek 
uh, political parties, uh, you know, we're going to advocate for this party over another. He understood about war and uh, and spoke really the truth. And anyway, I knew a little about him and I knew a little about his website. But what I had done, I in the Pentagon, frustrated, I started writing these little short, I mean, very short little vignettes. And they were uh, kind of entertaining, I thought. They were entertaining to me and they helped me blow off some steam about what I was seeing. And I initially I had when I got to the point and I shared them with my friends and buddies and they, they laughed and stuff. So, um, you know, nodded their head kind of thing. And so then I contacted Lou Rockwell, who I had been reading since about nine, since he started in 1998, 99. And um, I sent it to Lou and I said, but I can't, you know, I, I got these have to if you publish these, if you'd like to publish them, you can. But it, you can't, it has to be done anonymously because I can't obviously I'll <laughs> this kind of uh, even though it wasn't very significant uh disagreement it was it was significant disagreement but i mean it wasn't very harmful to the to this system but i would have been uh, probably routed out and done some jail time i'm sure based on where i had been working so so i told him like it has to be anonymous and he says we don't do that lou rockwell said we don't do that so uh, my second choice uh was i sent him to uh, hackworth's website well hackworth kind of managed that and i think he had a, he had another guy there helping him but in any case i i did and it, I heard back immediately from Colonel Hackworth, uh, he asked a few questions, but he seemed to, he seemed to know what I was saying was true or the perspective that I was taking was accurate. Um, and I didn't, I really didn't, I was surprised actually, because, you know, another thing about Hackworth is he didn't believe women should be in the, in certainly in the combat troops of the military. He did not, he was very outspoken about that because he had seen war and that was, um, a, you know, a big part of, uh, you know, again, it, it puts, he thought he believed, and I think rightfully in some ways uh, that this would be dangerous to the troops. Um, you know, so he opposed that. So I didn't know what his view towards me specifically, because obviously I identified who I was and he, you know, why I needed it to not have my name associated. Anyway, he, he jumped on it and it was only months later, maybe even after I got out that I realized that I was not, uh, of course, uh, his only source in the system. He had literally probably hundreds of uh, not just fans, but people that he knew um, personally, uh, people in various parts of the Pentagon and, and in the intelligence community, probably the State Department, too, that were all communicating with him. And he he knew what I was saying was just one piece and a, a very well-fitting piece of the puzzle. So um, anyway, he agreed to publish them. And at that point, I I. Uh, I think I actually, after the first couple, had a login, and I just posted them directly. And most of them were posted right out of the Pentagon, right off my government computer. I mean, again, this was, this was, this was it was after 9-11, but, it, you know, obviously 10, 15 years, um, especially after Ed Snowden and some of this stuff, they've cracked down on computer security quite a bit. Right. So what I, what I did was uh, not unsafe in the time frame that I did it. If a person did that now... Uh, they would be quickly shut down. I'm pretty sure. So, so what? You just go home and do it off your, you know, your home computer. I don't. That's right. It's not, hey, it, a call for more whistleblowers. Yeah, it's not over yet. Um, and yeah, they can, you know, they could go to the sandwich shop and log in at the. Absolutely. You know, oh my goodness. And now, and you know, we didn't have Proton Mail or we didn't have Hush Mail. Of course, Hush Mail, they've moved their server back to Delaware, so that's no good. But. Um, you know, there's Proton Mail. There's any number of uh, encrypted, automatic encrypted uh, chat and email services. And uh, you know what? I think it's fair to say that, honestly, when you're talking about sending 19 year olds who don't know the first thing about it to go possibly get their legs and their manhood blown off and maybe their entire life ended in Afghanistan or, you know, hunting down missiles for the Saudis in Yemen or on some yep. errand out there like that. Um then people who are, you know, more like in the position that you were in inside the Pentagon and that kind of thing ought to, if, if, we're, if they're asking the physical courage from the 19-year-olds, they ought to have the moral courage to, you know, hey, maybe even go to prison in That's order right. to tell That's the right. truth to protect them, right? That's right. It's the same That's thing right. as risking your life to provide cover fire for your other guys, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's actually le much less than that because, you know, we're not going to get disfigured. We're not going to, uh, you know, uh, be in a wheelchair the rest of our life because we told the truth about what we were seeing. It's not that it's not even remotely that dangerous. Um, you know, I, I hate to say we have and, and some of the uh, recipients 
uh, have done well several of the recipients Kiriku, um uh Chelsea Manning you know these guys have done guys and gals have done uh jail time uh for for uh doing take the acts of conscience but you know they they, they weren't <laughs> This this is it, it truly I'm sorry it doesn't compare to to some of the stuff that's happened to these very innocent patriots who believed what their government was telling them and volunteered to go over there and, and you know I, it just burns me <laughs> for all the folks that are hurt they go well it's an all volunteer force well you know what that works if you're telling the truth if your government is lying to you it's not really the same as an all volunteer force right because you're, and you're, when the American people the so called sovereign civilian uh, supreme you know, creators of this republic here abdicate all responsibility to discuss and debate these subjects for fear of hurting the soldiers' feelings. And yeah. then, you know, when the soldiers think that premise number one is that the democracy, as in, you know, the adult population of the society, are yeah. bothering to notice whether it's worth it to send them to war or not. It's, it's crazy. It's I mean, and you hear soldiers say, whether they're talking about Vietnam or even in the terror wars, they say, my country sent me over there, then my country doesn't care about me and this and that. And it's like, well, you know, yep. it depends on how you use those terms. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty much right. Yep. It's it's true. And, and it, you know, we, we uh, have an opportunity as, as every, you know, generation or the we get more and more, you know, younger people and the older folks pass away or become less active. Um, you know, things change a little bit in our culture. Uh, the parties have have some role to play and both of those political parties are the main ones that are, you know, the ones that field all these congressmen that vote for these wars. Um, both of them have a, a pro-war side, but also both those parties are fragmenting into, um, you know, on the Republican side, you have kind of a liberty uh, 1930s Republican uh, America first type thing where where they're very cautious about uh, interventions in war. Don't want to pay for it that you know they're more of the traditional conservative and also the valuing of freedom and liberty and then in the in the uh, democrat party a lot of the young democrats they care about justice um yeah maybe they like a little socialism they don't know what it is for sure you know they're interested in it i hope they learn more uh, and i'm sure that they will as time goes on but these people aren't warmongers the warmongers are the over 50 crowd in both parties uh, for the most part who have been elected over and over again and i'm just frankly Okay, I got an email today. Said call the Congress. Uh, no, call Pelosi, Pelosi's office, and uh, tell the the, the uh, majority leader, uh, whatever she is next time, select. She's going to be the soon. Tell her to make sure that the hearing on getting out of the Yemen war and stopping the war on Yemen happens, and so they don't keep blocking it, which is what they've been doing. They keep blocking it. Both parties are participating in this, and I thought to myself, Pelosi, she's. 82 years old. What the, what is going on here? Yeah. I mean, what, what is, who is by the shit? way, are you ever going to run for Congress again? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. No, I, it was, it, you know, that's a bad thing about running for any big office. I mean, like that. I would vote. start a war for the chance to see you in Ron Paul's spot in the House of Representatives. <laughs> Just to have one person up there getting it right, Karen, it would be so uh, great. Well, it would, it would be fun, but um, yeah, so far I've not. And we've actually, uh, of course, you're good lad who was, I was, upset about and that was who i primaried mm -hmm. in 2012 he's he has decided after i guess 13 terms to step down and we did elect another person and i will say this the machine good let's machine elected this guy there's absolutely no doubt we saw because i'm i'm a participant in republican party uh politics mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still the same advocate for i'm an anti-war advocate and whatnot and i say what i think but i in order not to have somebody else take the space, I take the space and I can see what they're doing. And I, and I participate and try to move in the right direction. That is a futile thing to do, by the way, but I'm there doing that. So it was Goodlatte's machine that elected uh, this guy. And, and he did have face competition by the Democrats. We have a little blue wave going on here. It didn't, didn't uh, wipe him out, but it, there was a lot of democratic voters. Anyway, the guy says, uh, Klein is his name. He says he's going to be part of the Freedom Caucus, that he's going to associate with Amash and Massey and all these guys and Jordan. Um, you know, that's what he says. So we'll see what happens. Um, yeah. I think I think that I take that. In fact, he and the, the other Republican who was uh, almost w w would have been the other choice. Both of them were running on the same exact ticket, the same exact platform I ran on in 2012. So I do consider that a victory. I don't think that 
I have to be there if we can change the conversation. We did change the conversation. However, I don't trust them. See, with you, you know, Scott, if it was me, <laughs> there's yeah, I that, it really does been. come down to the individual at the end of the day, you know, yeah. for so sure. These guys, um, it's hard to say if we could have trusted uh, either one of them, and Klein was the less trustworthy of the two. They were both running on very much the same uh, platform. Hey, guys, here's how to help support the show. First of all, buy my book. Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. Everybody likes it. Uh, it's got great reviews. Uh, read the paperback, the Kindle, or the audiobook. And uh, the EPUB is available at Barnes & Noble and everywhere else online as well. Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And uh, also, I take donations. If you go to scotthorton.org slash donate, you'll see the uh, kickbacks. You can get a lifetime subscription to listen and think audiobooks or a silver commodity disc for any donation of $100. And you get a signed copy of Fool's Errand for 50 so that ain't too bad. And um, anyone who donates by way of PayPal or Patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show, $5 or more per month, and you will get access to the private subreddit, uh, the new Reddit group there, at r slash Scott Horton Show. And uh, all new signers, uppers, to uh, Patreon, also get two free audiobooks as well. And yes, I take every kind of cryptocurrency, most especially Horizon, uh, but also Bitcoin and the rest of them too. So check all that out at scotthorton.org slash donate and patreon.com slash Show. Thanks. Oh yeah, and don't forget to shop amazon.com by way of my link at the bottom of my page at scotthorton.org. You'll see it there. Uh, your archive going all the way back to including all the soldiers for the truth stuff for David Hackworth, if I remember right, is all posted at LRC. Yeah, so pretty, it should be all at there. some point, the, the full archive was transferred from Hackworth's site to lewrockwell.com. So people can read the stuff that you were writing anonymously from the Pentagon, watching in real time as uh, your boss, Bill Ludi, was also part of the Office of Special Plans oh, yeah. with yeah. Abram Shulsky and Douglas Fyth and... Yep. All the guys lying us into war there. And um, and there's real important journalism about it, too. Um, just, you know, we mentioned the uh, the American Conservative series about it. In Rumsfeld's Shop, Conscientious Objector, an Open Door Policy featuring uh, Israelis. Uh, very interestingly in that one. And then there was the New Pentagon Papers at Salon.com. That was a good one. And then Jason Vest and Bob Dreyfus wrote The Lie Factory. And yep, yep. Vest also wrote The Men from Jinsa. Mm, and yeah. um, then yep. uh, let's see, there's the uh, what got you the award here uh, was you're leaking to uh, Strobel and Landay working together at Knight Ritter. And all of those archives can be found at McClatchyDC.com. You have to oh, kind of search yeah. around. It's not that easy to find, but they do have them all. 2001, they were already publishing, you know, anti-weapons of mass destruction stuff in there. Yeah, yeah, those guys are those guys are great, and they are the models of what what uh, you know any large media or small media should be doing, and so it's it's mm -hmm. uh, it's really most, great. I, I think mo almost all those articles that I mentioned there. I mean, there are a lot about the neocons, but almost all those are centered around you, and of course, the first four I mentioned they're written by you, and then of course, as I mentioned, the archive at LRC, um, because this was such a big deal, uh, the way that they did this and. And yeah. it's no. so instructive who did it and how they did it and and how it all worked there and and your uh you know point of view on how that all unfolded the separate government as Colin Powell later called it that Cheney and the neocons set up inside the first Bush Jr. term there. That's right. That's right. And and I'll tell you, um, this information is good for people. Anybody slightly interested in this should go look at it because a lot of it. Is kind of happening again. And if you, I, I am not uh, uh, the Jinsa, the men from Jinsa that, that Jason Vest put together. Yeah. That, and of course, anything that I've written, because I certainly named the names and provided links in any articles that I published there. But um, but if you look at the people, and you mentioned Ludi and Fife and uh, you know all these guys, uh, if you look at these names, um, and then you actually closely study and look at what's happening today and where some of these people are. Uh, John Bolton, of course, we're very familiar with John Bolton. He, um, 
of course, you know, national security advisor. And he has brought up many of these same people into the White House. So it's not just John Bolton up there. There's a whole bunch of people, his his uh, people he's hired to help him with national security stuff, appointees that he has influenced. And these are some of the same names. They're just 15 years older. It's the exact same people. Um, their agenda, I don't think, has changed Uh you know, they they are interested in uh, using the United States uh, reputation and resources to sow chaos um, for one of our friends in the Middle East uh, and their allies. OK, um, obviously, I'm talking about Israel and Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, this sowing of chaos in support of Israel and Saudi Arabia is, is all what Yemen is about. Um, we have no fight in Yemen. We have no uh strategic interest uh, unless we're planning on, you know, owning the port of Aden. I don't know what they have planned, but this is wrong. What's happening and the people that, that are advocating it and that are articulating this to our, to the current president uh, are many of the same people. And this is a little bit scary. Now, Trump is a little bit different than Obama or W. He's different. He comes from a different place. I think he is an excellent reader of, of people. Um, you know, I, I think maybe, uh, you know, he's not, uh, he likes to be in charge. So he doesn't like people telling him what he has to do and what he doesn't have to do. I think W was quite comfortable in being told what to do. I mean, to um, me, Donald Trump is just a perfect image of Obama in every way, including oh, well, the attacks over the legitimacy of his presidency, which under Obama <laughs> were spearheaded by Trump. Ha ha. So <laughs> even though I think all this Russia stuff is nonsense, there's kind of yeah. no one who deserves it more than him in terms of calling someone, uh, you know, or being yeah. called, a. Uh, unrightful usurper and all this kind of thing. But then when it comes to rolling over for the generals on Afghanistan and Yemen and Somalia and Syria and everything, he whimpers and then he rolls over just like Barack. He does. He does. But, you know, he's fi he fires more people, I think, than Obama did. And I like that because um, people don't know when the you know, when the hammer's going to come down. Um, and they don't know why it will come down. It could be he wakes up on the wrong side of the bed and somebody gets fired. So I think that unpredictability and the fact that he is willing to uh, let people go and move people around. I have to um, admit, actually, last night, me and the wife were talking about, wow, I wonder who's going to be the new chief of staff. Because that could mean everything, right? <laughs> what if he named Doug Bandow? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah. Yeah. Or or Doug Fife. <laughs> yeah. Right. Or Doug McGregor. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, it, it's it is interesting um, to watch it all. And, you By know, the way, the it thing, doesn't have to be someone named Doug, you know. No, it doesn't. No. It doesn't. But there are plenty. We, we There's some acceptable Dougs out there that we could have. Not but, fight, though. Yeah. No, no, not at all. But, you know, uh, uh, yeah, Trump is uh, I don't know. Some of the things he says, I I do like. I mean, he talks about. On the same day that, that Pompeo, this is last week, I guess, on the 4th, Pompeo says, you know, we're, we're ending the INF Treaty, 60 days. You know, both the U.S., we act like we're the only ones that follow. No, the U.S. does not follow the INF Treaty. We're in violation of that thing, just like the Russians are. So it's like, you know, we act like we're all holier than the, than everybody. But the fact that he said, okay, we're going to get out of that. And that, of course, has an impl implications. I mean, some very dangerous ones and perhaps, you know, depending on what comes next, maybe good things. I don't know. If it's replaced by another treaty that covers things that needs to cover with more signatories, you know, it could be a good thing. But at the same day that Pompeo made that speech, you know, Trump tweeted about how expensive, you know, the arms race is. Well, it is expensive. And I'm glad that he tweeted that it was. You know, I mean, that shows something. That right. Shows but wait, no, he already took that back. And he says that oh, now he, he wants the next one to be another 33 billion higher. 733 for next year so oh 750 sorry yeah well I do keep think up karen he's already flip-flopped that waffle <laughs> well, that's not good but i do think he's a progressive i think he'll work very well with the democrats unfortunately the democrats are warmongers and yeah. so the next year and getting are, worse and yeah. getting worse yeah. mm -hmm. but, but you know the more they do warmonger we are going to see generational breaks in the congress uh where the younger people in all of the both parties um, are opposing the older people of uh, of both parties. And of course, right. the really young Ron Paul is is with the younger people. Like, and I'll like, tell you what, you know, that Thomas Massey, I don't know everything yeah. about him and his entire voting record or whatever, but I think I really like that guy. I think yeah, he could be the Ron yeah, Paul of the House, um, yeah, you know, really if he's willing. I think, in fact, if he has a problem, it's the same one as Ron, is that he's too nice. Mm -hmm. kind of yeah. needs to be a little bit meaner to be a, a better fighter but he, he's apparently seems to be good on everything that, as far as i know 
he's he's extremely good and he he lives a life that we would be familiar with <laughs> you know and when he goes home he he chops wood and takes care of his bees and just you know you know he's he's a, a really interesting guy and experiments with with uh, stuff because he's an engineer he's an engineer minded guy right. but um yeah but i'll tell you too the 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 power i mean it's growing the the liberty type language um the anti-war language it's growing um War is expensive and it's stupid and it kills people and it causes all this pain and anxiety. It's not really a win-win for anybody but the banks and a few politicians and maybe some oil people and whatnot. So, you know, when when there's people that are like Massey and others, in, the fact that they may be a little soft-spoken and they're friendly and nice, that's not bad because they're spending, they're communicating. People will listen to people like that. And, right. um, and, and you know, a lot of times our arguments, um, our debates – you know, if you that, that really just shows how corrupt I am, that that's my objection <laughs> to him. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I, I think, you know, a lot of people because my brother, uh, who, who we share many of the same ideals, a bit, he's he's gone off the he, he's way on the uh, Democratic Socialist bandwagon. And he was it's very different than how I was raised and different from how he was. But our goals are very similar, both hardcore anti-war. So when it's long we're talking about anti-war, we're good. Um, and, and I think the more we talk. Uh, the language of war and the cost of war and the stupidity of it and the fact that the people getting us into these wars are idiots. You know, we need to talk about that. Um, it's fair to call them, uh, I think it's fair to call them an idiot. I mean, I don't want to insult legitimate idiots. I mean, but these guys are really unqualified to make these decisions about uh, uh, getting us into wars, getting us into interventions that are going to lead to wars um, you know, the, some of the things we're doing is just, it's, it's nuts. And, and the other bad thing, this is a negative. And I think I mentioned it in, in my talk a little bit, but you know, our base building has continued unabated. We may have fewer bases in Germany, but, uh, we've got bases everywhere in Syria. We have these monster bases. Do you know that on the right, east side? Yeah. yeah. In monster. fact, there's a, a new piece out. I think it was in uh, Politico or something about the army base out there in Syrian Kurdistan, a, a huge one. Yeah. Yeah. So so we're doing and then if you look at the big map, you know, you can see we're surrounding Russia, we're surrounding uh, Iran. You know, we have this this uh, huge plan that if you decide to sell your oil on anything but the U.S. dollar, you know, we're going to go to war with you. I mean, I, I, I still honestly think a lot of it has to do with with resources. Um, oh, but Scott, yes. there's a guy there's a guy who um, hope he, he wrote a dissertation and he dedicated it to me. I was pretty honored and I did help him a little bit not much help him but whatever anyway he's a intel he wrote it on the intel breakdown of the time frame that we're talking about back in 2002-3 and um anyways part of his research he actually interviewed Cheney and Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz and all these guys I mean Ooh. all the way yeah a guy that dedicated his thing to you interviewed them for it that's yeah and and he did it in such a way that they all thought because he said can I get a copy of that yeah, I'm, I'll send you what's the published, the unpublished one. He, he did it in the University of Calgary, and he kept it on uh, non-American servers the whole time. He's got a lot of background information that's not in uh, – I mean, it's well-documented in the actual dissertation, but the, even the Calgary University of Calgary people uh, told him, there's stuff in here. You really – we're not going to allow you to say that because Canada will get hurt by the U.S. when you say these things. And even though they're completely honest, well-documented, and true, he had to – water it down a little bit kind of like you say Massey you know well sometimes you got to water stuff down we watered down a little bit but it's still very powerful but all the time when he was doing the research with the actual players of this time and this is of course he finished it up I think year year and a half ago mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe a year ago I know it came out last spring published um anyway he he his his to get the interviews and part of his process was to say to them I am researching the intelligence community failure, and you guys are going to help me understand how our Demo how our intelligence community failed you as decision makers. Which right, you you're happy. So they're offering him jobs and all this stuff, and he's still on their friendly list. That um, is awesome. I can't wait to read that thing. Let me tell you, Scott. I'm going to hook you up with this guy on Proton Mail, um, and and I think we'll hear more from him. He um, uh, he's got a two PhDs, and he's an SES. He was an SES three in the Trump administration. That's how high up he is, hmm. and of course, former military. And the interesting thing about his work, and it's like 
you know, we all come to where we are through a pathway, right? And his, he started out in the army as a criminal investigator. So he writes, he knows how to do, he knows how to do crime investigation. <laughs> That's how he approached this because it was a crime. It was certainly a crime. Um, anyway, it's, he's, uh, he's out of the country now, uh, working at the EU on a five-year contract. So he is, right. I, I'm sorry, I, Karen. I I'm so over time here. I'm supposed to be interviewing no. David Swanson about Pearl Harbor, and oh, and I'm yeah. being so rude to him right now because I love talking to you so much. But well, um, I miss you. It's because I miss you, Scott. I, I know I it's to great to talk to you again. I'm so sorry that uh, it got scheduled this way, but um, I definitely hope we can do this again soon. Please write for me at the Institute or at Antiwar.com anytime you want to. I sure will. I sure will. Okay. Thanks a lot. And, and everybody you can read at uh, antiwar.com on the blog right now is uh, Karen's acceptance speech and Ray McGovern's uh, dedication here from her Sam Adams Award for her great whistleblowing there. And then the show notes will include links to all the articles that were mentioned today as well. Thank you again so much, Karen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all. Thanks. Find me at libertarianinstitute.org, at scotthorton.org, antiwar.com and reddit.com slash Scott Horton Show. Oh yeah, and read my book, Fool's Errand, Timed and the War in Afghanistan at foolserand.us.